Member for Portersville North, St. John's West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I rise to enter this debate to respond and also to tell the nation what it is that has happened and what will happen in a number of areas, I'd like to start, it would be remiss of me not to start by thanking the people of Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West for the opportunity to represent them and to serve them once again for the overwhelming re-election numbers in a general election, even though it was held in a pandemic. I also would like to thank the Honorable Prime Minister for the privilege to serve as a Minister of National Security and as a Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister. And to thank the people of Trinidad and Tobago for their mandate to the PNM for another five years of governance. And to remind the population almost two months ago, and especially those on the other side in opposition, to remind them that a population two months ago rejected lies and the destructive ways of the UNC and returned the PNM to governance for the next five years. Madam Speaker, respectfully, what we've heard for the past three hours is a script prepared by handlers who led the member for Separia to a record 11th loss at the polls on August 10th, 2020. But the danger is that the information thrown at the population, which is untrue and designed to mis mislead, must be corrected. This is an opposition that is clearly in denial that our country's problems are not singular an opposition that continues to ignore what is taking place globally and its effects on Trinidad and Tobago. So I'd spend a little bit of time, not much, correcting some of the misinformation put out in the last three hours. The first disturbing thing to me as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago is the continued narrative by a UNC opposition that they won a popular vote in Trinidad, completely ignoring the fact that there is a country called and a state, Trinidad and Tobago. And as a citizen, I take umbrage to this continued attack on Tobago, the sister isle of Trinidad and Tobago. Very early o'clock, in the leader of the opposition's contribution, this very disturbing statement was made. As she stated, the member for Separia, and I quote, this country has a sell-by date, and that date has expired. Madam Speaker, I noted this, and for a person who aspires to lead this country, I find it very distasteful, and of serious concern to me as a citizen. And I reject this proposition. As a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I reject this outright because this is my country. This is my Trinidad and Tobago. And it has no sell-by date. I found this to be offensive. A lot of time was spent on COVID. We are still in a global pandemic, that is COVID. We are still seeing what is taking place internationally. And I am certain that my colleague, the member for St. Joseph, will spend some time on the health side of what this government did successfully in protecting the population. When COVID appeared on our shores on the 12th of March of this year, and what we've continued to do, but I remind the opposition that on the 10th of August 2020, the population did decide and decide very clearly 
who it is that should continue to govern this country and take us through the difficulties of COVID. The misinformation that continues with respect to gas and gas prices and point leases. All that we've heard in the last three hours in this area is a confirmation that the leader of the opposition has no handle, no understanding on the energy sector of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'd like to put it to rest immediately, all this screaming and shouting and continued narrative about the Prime Minister negotiating gas deals and the collapse and the gas price in Houston. Fortunately, we have a leader. Fortunately, we have a leader who knows what is going on in our energy sector. And when it was in 2015 and prior, there was no gas price decided between National Gas Company and any upstreamer taking us forward and taking the country forward with no gas price. I heard the screams of, oh, we are the ones responsible for Angelin and Jupiter. But what the country again is not being told, that with respect to all of those deals, they had not negotiated a gas price. And what this country was facing in March 2017 was a failure of any continuation of gas price to take us forward in the future. NGC and BP, the largest upstreamer producer of gas, had reached a brick wall and they had downed their tools. There was no conversation taking place. So what happened in Houston is a leader using the relationship that he had as the prime minister of the country, asking to see the highest levels of BP, going to Houston and getting NGC and BP back to the table to negotiate. And that was successfully done. This false narrative about the gas price, if I may just spend a few minutes on it. Madam Speaker, what the population needs to understand is the prices that were negotiated, because that is what was taking place at the time, is a gas price formula based on some parts on commodity pricing. So as the prices of ammonia and methanol rose or dropped, so would the gas price being paid for the upstream gas. What I find ironic and hypocritical, though, is the two gas contracts, the only two gas contracts negotiated by the UNC prior to 2015 are the two worst gas contracts for the country of Trinidad and Tobago, and the two gas contracts that are saddling NGC today and the population needs to know that. Because the only two contracts that they negotiated prior to 2015 are the PL and L and the CGCL contracts. And those two contracts now are yokes around the shoulders and necks of NGC and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So add to that the fact that they did not negotiate downstream contracts for the rest of the Point Lisa's estate. And when we came in, we met billions of US dollars of claims that had to be dealt with because there was a gas shortage and curtailment. So to stand up here once again and mislead the population and say that at the time they left 3.8 um, million scuffs of gas being produced a year, is com a day, sorry, is completely untrue. We met billions of dollars of claims at the time before 2015, a minister of energy, every time he was asked about what is going on with curtailment of gas and gas shortages at plants at Point Lisas, the response was maintenance. We all now know that is untrue. We all now know that not a single gas contract apart from CGCL was negotiated, and that is the singular worst, in addition to the P&L contract, for gas at, around NGC's throats. Every loss-making contract for gas supply was due to the United National Congress. All of the claims, the collapse of the global commodity prices is what is affecting Point Lisas today. So this continued false narrative that the difficulties at Point Lisas are based on the Houston pricing. I tell the country today that we have renegotiated 
the prices in Houston with EOG, with BP, we've renegotiated with Shell, we've renegotiated with BHP for better gas prices from our upstreamers today, even beyond what happened in Houston in 2017. But what the country needs to understand, and I'm sure they do, despite the continued false narratives, is that the global commodity market has collapsed, including an oversupply of LNG in the world. The plants that have shut down at Point Lisa's, because yes, plants have shut down, are due to their age and inefficiency. Again, what we're hearing here today is an ignorance of the truth and of the reality. Truth and the reality of what our energy sector is about. The Yara plant that was referred to is one of the oldest plants built over 30 years ago. It is inefficient. Are we to subsidize with taxpayers' money inefficiency and inefficient plants? The answer is no. And that is how we have dealt with it. There's been an empowered negotiation team. We've built up the relationships with the upstreamers and the downstreamers. And that work continues up to today. That work continues. This week, Minister Khan and myself were having virtual meetings with the boardrooms of the large multinational plants at Point Lisas. The nutrients, the methanexes, and all of this work is being undertaken. And you know what is being undertaken for the first time properly? A protection of the future of Trinidad and Tobago. Sophisticated negotiations taking place by the government with experts on its teams as we look at the gas value chain and do what needs to be done to continue to protect the industry of Trinidad and Tobago and not have it decimated in the way that it was prior to 2015. It pains me as a citizen to come here and to listen to these falsities and this misleading information because the truth is by 2015, all of the good work that had been done or may have been done prior to 2010 had been decimated in the energy industry. It was found in shambles. I'm listening here today about the sector now running on fumes. Again, that is not true. Anyone can go and look at what is happening globally. Methanol and ammonia prices have crashed. COVID brought about a complete lack of demand for these products. There was oversupply in the global markets, and that is what Trinidad and Tobago is facing the consequences of here today. Nothing more than that. Yes, prices have gone up for gas, as they should, because Trinidad and Tobago, gas is an asset, it's a resource that is deplenishing. And what we're facing here today, for example, with ammonia, is for the first time in decades, the price of gas in Europe it's cheaper than even Henry Hub in the United States. That was unheard of years ago. But if the UNC had spent some time trying to protect Trinidad and Tobago and the gas prices prior to leaving office in 2015, maybe the country would have been in a better place. But this government and this administration, without fear of contradiction, has done a remarkable job in standing up to the multinationals upstream, downstream, working with them as well, but making sure that we extract a fair return for the people of Trinidad and Tobago and protecting for the future of Trinidad and Tobago. There is no Houston blotch negotiations or uncompetitive gas price. That shows the ignorance. You are dealing with jurisdictions that have larger gas reserves than Trinidad and Tobago. There was a point in time in the United States not too long ago, in fact, in 2017, when negotiations were taking place, that the United States oil producers were paying people to take gas because gas is a byproduct of oil production. How do you compete with that? And we have, effectively, because even in this day and age's global competitive environment, Trinidad and Tobago continues to attract the spend of the global dollars from these multinationals. BP has not stopped. BHP has not stopped. In fact, BHP is doing record deep water exploration with an eye towards production. Shell has not stopped. EOG has not stopped. 
and we still have persons coming looking for opportunities. What is going on at Point Lisas is unfortunate, but it is not relegated to Trinidad and Tobago alone. It is as a result of global commodity prices crashing. Plants that were inefficient have to come out of the system. This government will not bow over to sell the patrimony of Trinidad and Tobago and subsidize gas for inefficient plants. Because as the inefficient plants leave, the efficient plants will come. And that is how a patriotic government deals with the business of Trinidad and Tobago. Lauren Manatee. Again, my stomach shifted as I heard the assault and the attack and the dog whistling on Lauren Manatee. What we are dealing with with Lauren Manatee is a gas field that straddles an international border. And on the Venezuelan side, there are sanctions being applied. Let us not forget that. The same opposition who a few months ago as we sat in Parliament, we went through weeks of them calling for the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister to be personally sanctioned by the United States, calling for sanctions on Trinidad and Tobago by the United States. And what did this government do? Needing gas and gas production for the future? We negotiated to be able to access the gas on the Trinidadian side. So to listen to the suggestion that there's anything untoward with that, and being told we should not go it alone, and it's unusual and ill-advised to tap into this, is with the greatest of respect, complete rubbish. As usual, it's a UNC dog whistle. The manatee field is on the Trinidad and Tobago border. And we will go it alone. And this week, we began the negotiations and discussions with Shell for the future production of that gas. Because you see, this government doesn't do things for today for today. We are looking at what has to take place down the road. But once again, and I put the country on notice, and thank God the country did what it did on the 10th of August, having listened to the ignorance and the lack of knowledge of the energy sector for the last three hours. It shows a complete lack of understanding. Cars, the, the, the whole conversation and narrative on cars, again, I must correct it. The decisions taken in this budget are based on a policy, a policy where we are spending and we earn foreign exchange, US dollars through the energy sector. As we know, the revenue has fallen. The country needs to know that 450 million US dollars are spent on motor vehicles a year. I heard the suggestion that by the, the imposition of taxes on vehicles and us doing a policy to protect our limited foreign exchange, it is going to affect the small garages and body shops. It is quite the opposite. And I am putting on record here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they are currently, I just got the statistics from the Minister of Works and Transport, there are over 1.1 million registered vehicles on Trinidad and Tobago's roads. 1.1 million. And you know how many driver's permits are current? It's you, and it doesn't mean that they're driving. 600,000. So for every driver's permit issued, we already have almost two vehicles per driver's permit in Trinidad and Tobago. The body shops and the paint shops and the mechanics will get work as we must continue to maintain the vehicles that are here. We didn't stop all vehicles coming, but we must protect our foreign exchange. And it is being applauded. So the continued dog whistling is again rejected. Grew the economy. This, this talk about grew the economy. The UNC didn't grow the economy. What they grew is expenditure. When the UNC came into power, our annual budget was about $41 billion. The UNC grew it from $41 billion to $63 billion. 20 billion, and they must answer to the people where that went. So they didn't grow the economy, they grew the expenditure. Talk about overdraft conversation, overdraft and debt conversation. 
and reading from a script without understanding it. Otherwise, the leader of the opposition wouldn't have said it. First of all, they accept that there has been a drop in revenue. So I always wonder if a person accepts that there's been a drop in revenue, where do they expect to maintain the existing expenditure? Or where do they expect to grow revenue from? The hypocrisy of this statement and this conversation on the overdraft is I must remind the country, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that in 2010, there was $6 billion in cash in the Treasury. No overdraft. In 2010, they came in and they met $6 billion in the account. That was completely spent. They left in 2015 a $9 billion overdraft. So that's $15 billion they spent of cash. And let us not forget what they did when they plundered the NGC and took $14 billion from there as well. So $30 billion in cash at a time when energy prices were much better. And then come now to tell the country that there must not be an overdraft facility and a debt-to-equity ratio. We're dealing with different times. Let us deal with the reality. Another point to be made, deficit budgeting. Again, I don't know if they understand, but since 2008, every budget in Trinidad and Tobago for the last 12 years, including five between 2010 and 2015, has been a budget, a deficit budget. Every single one since 2008. The CLF liquidation and another dog whistle about the sale of malls. There is no truth to that whatsoever. The government is not permitting, nor is the liquidator of the CLF group looking to sell any mall at this point in time. There is no fire sale of malls going on, but what I again remind the population about is that this government's astute leadership took on the CLF problem frontally. The government took it on. The taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago were saddled with a $30 billion unsecured loan to the CLF shareholders, a private few people. $30 billion between 2010 and 2015. Nothing done to secure that debt. We went in, we put it into liquidation when the shareholders were pushing back and exposing the taxpayer. No interest being charged either. But the interest and all the expenses come up to $30 billion. And it is by that which we did as an administration, having the astuteness, but also the fortitude to take on the fight, put CLF into liquidation and fix that problem and created things like the NIF to protect. So again, fiction. There's no sale or fire sale of any assets, not under this government. Service station concerns. I will, I will leave the service stations for the Minister of Finance to respond to, as well as the Minister of Energy. But it would be remiss of me not to put down a marker here as I heard the cry about service stations. I cast my mind back and I'm putting it on the hand and I want the population to understand what a previous administration in 2010 to 2015 did with the taxpayers' service stations. One of their sitting senators got a service station. One of their members who has gone up for the last two general elections got another service station. A family member of a UNC member of cabinet got a service station on Rison Road. Right? And UNC financiers got service stations. That is how they wanted to dispose of it and disposed of service stations. I will leave now the member. Members, please. Again. Hello. Separia, member for Separia. Again, please, I would like to hear the discourse of the honorable member. And again, as I'm on my legs, remember the procedure is clear. Once speaking, you still have to keep your mask on your face. Please, members. Let's abide by the rules. Proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I expect the noise. Because the course of action in here shows that anytime you touch a sensitive nerve, 
That is the reaction you get from the other side. So to listen to them talk about conflict and to listen to the hypocrisy, it needed to be dealt with. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because there was very little else to respond to from the last three hours of this course, but I will now deal with matters of national security. I heard the laughs and the cries and, and again, the, the misinformation about what existed in 2015. First of all, this government is committed to the fight against crime and criminality, and we have been working with the assets that we have we have been going out and spending billions of dollars on toys and technology, the way that happened, without proper procurement. I remind the country, the, the going and purchasing of helicopters that never even made it to Trinidad and Tobago, that we're now tied up in litigation for half a billion dollars spent on certain assets without anything being done to implement and to put it into use. This government has used a multi-agency approach. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or Defense Force or Intelligence Services, even prisons and immigration, all sit around a table now and work together using the assets that they each have to make Trinidad and Tobago a safer and more secure place. We have introduced and implemented, and it is working, a national operation fusion center and a national introduced for the first time a national intelligence fusion center. And just to briefly, without giving away the confidentiality and the national security issues there, explain how these operate. A national operation fusion center that is being worked as we speak and providing results is a gathering under the same roof of representatives who are vetted, not handpicked by politicians, but vetted, and they sit in the same area they do the analysis, they have the technology, the information comes in as to how they should move forward. So the National Operation Fusion Center is working. We have introduced for the first time a National Intelligence Fusion Center, a body where analysts sit and intelligence from all arms of national security, the police service, the prisons, the defense force, the SSA, feeds up and other areas, feeds up into this body that analyzes it and then puts the appropriate reports for action to the, the, the bodies that need to. As I sat and reflected on the last year, I want to remind the country respectfully through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of one of the most successful exercises that again Trinidad and Tobago led the charge on and is now the case study, the number one case study in the world for how to do it successfully. The demonetization exercise in 2019, let us not forget the success of that exercise. It was a national security venture. There were only three persons in the country who knew and who implemented this successful demonetization. And we have shown the world how it should be done. Just to explain briefly to the population, because we were here in December of last year, what that meant is removing the largest banknote that exists in Trinidad and Tobago, the $100 cotton note. We did it against all naysayers, against all of the pushbacks in the shortest period of time it has ever been done in the world. In the world. When we were preparing for it, we looked at India, we looked at what happened in Mauritius and Ireland, Similar in size to Trinidad and Tobago. They could not get it done in the period of time that we got it done. The success of that demonetization exercise and where it struck at the heart of corruption is borne out at the end. We brought in $8 billion worth of new polymer banknotes, $100 bills. At the end of the exercise, $500 million of old cotton notes have not returned to the central bank. So it is a safe assumption that $500 million of corrupt money was not allowed to return. And as I hear the members, because you could always tell, you know, you could always tell when it touches a nerve. And the population will know. One second. 
Honorable members, please, I do not want to have to identify members who are not conforming to the wearing of the mask. I do not want to reach that stage, but if you all permit me to, I will have. Proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We all heard the rumors around the election time of the resurfacing of some cotton notes and on which side of the aisle it was resurfacing. Maybe that is the noise. But the demonetization exercise was a successful one in the last fiscal. It took two years of planning. The implementation was done in top secret. All of the other countries we studied with the experts, no other country did it in the short time frame that we did and as successfully as we did. And I want to use this opportunity to thank all of the protective services that were involved, the banking system that was involved. They all worked with us to make it happen and safely, resulting in $500 million of corrupt money not coming back into the economy. The scourge of domestic violence. The scourge of domestic violence does attract national security's attention. And it is something that you would recall, Mr. Deputy Speaker, just before the budget, in our last run-up to the elections, we as a parliament took certain decisions, and my colleagues will expand on it, in particular the member for Tobago East. The Attorney General worked with the member for Tobago East. They brought a suite of legislation designed to protect the victims of domestic violence. So we listen to what is being said out there and remind the country that we took the legislation to follow and we made the amendments. For example, from a national security point of view, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service brought into being a special unit with special training, the gender-based violence unit. The legislation was amended to allow persons to make a report now at any police station before it had to be at the district station. We've also implemented the electronic monitoring unit at national security. And the unit is operational. The legislation was proclaimed for the electronic monitoring on the 18th of September, and that unit is now operational. The next step is for the judiciary to begin utilizing these electronic monitoring bracelets, as I know they will, and we will expand it. This government is committed to doing what needs to be done there. COVID, national security played an extremely important role in the response to this global pandemic. And again, through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to take the opportunity as a minister to thank all of the frontline workers, the police service, the defense force, immigration, prisons, fire, for doing what needed to be done in responding to COVID. Right now, in the prison system, Last week, we opened a facility in Claxton Bay for those few prisoners who have tested positive to make sure they're kept separate from the general population but have available to them hospital facilities. We're doing the same thing right now as we speak for Tobago. And they have the commitment of national security to continue doing all that we've done from day one, being an integral pillar in this country's response to COVID. Borders. Borders is always a constant conversation, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and rightly so. So I'd like to take a few minutes to just talk about borders from a national security point of view. We have already implemented a multi-agency approach. So in the winding up, I heard the leader of the opposition talking about, we see it every year. It is working and it is there. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is working along with the Defense Force and Immigration, along with intelligence and the NOFC. With this ridiculous narrative of the opposition, always about porous borders, look at what is going on at every island, developed island in the world. I look at what goes on in Europe. I look at what goes on in, U in the United Kingdom as an island, in Europe on coastal countries, even in the United States. Once you have those types of borders, there are going to be attempts. We don't bury our head in the sand and pretend it's not happening but to continuously try to convince the population that there is not border security taking place is wrong. I'd like again, through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
thank the men and women of the Defense Force, in particular the Coast Guard and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and Immigration for their tireless work in this area. The coastal radar system is working. The coastal radar system has been and is being further upgraded. All of our assets are being used. I heard the, again the attempt to mislead the population about the demon vessels being at Stobels, showing again the complete ignorance of those on the other side as to how these things operate. The vessels have to come in for supplies and change of crew. Every single working vessel, demon vessel, is being utilized, but there are occasions when they're in a dock to refurbish, to also change crew, and to resupply. We did a refurbishment of our interceptors. Every interceptor that we could have gotten refurbished was refurbished and is out there working. The combined use of the Defense Force and the police service as land operations on our borders has been working. There are challenges, and in fact, one of the challenges we face right now is the onslaught of lawyers, and I won't call their names. All of a sudden, they have knowledge of when illegal Venezuelans are coming across, and before they even land, they rush into the court to try and get orders. Well, I stand here without fear of contradiction. As a government, we will continue to implement and to implement successfully the domestic laws of Trinidad and Tobago, because part of border protection, part of border protection is using the laws to deal with illegal immigration, and we will continue so to do in a humanitarian manner. The migrant registration was successful. 16,523 Venezuelans registered. The cabinet took a decision and extended that to the 31st of December, 2020. We will not allow the UNHCR registration process to be abused by coming and registering with the UNHCR does not give anyone a right to break the domestic laws of Trinidad and Tobago and to act in an illegal manner. It is not a get out of jail card. Human trafficking is real. There are locals involved. There is a local demand unfortunately for this human flesh and this is what we're fighting at national security and will continue to fight. We have a counter-trafficking unit at the Ministry of National Security, and I thank them for their tireless work and their effort, often calling me at midnight and other wee hours of the morning as they're dealing with the victims of human trafficking. I want to thank them for their hard work as they make the most of their limited resources. What we will be doing to increase border security, the same two Cape class vessels, and I noted it, and I want the population through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to note it, an assault on us getting two Cape class vessels. It reminded me of the cancellation of the OPVs. What is the UNC's problem with vessels of this nature patrolling our maritime space and protecting our borders? Why is it that they're so determined to attack OPVs and now attack the two Cape class vessels? Is it that they're protecting certain interests? The population will answer that. We're also going to be utilizing drones we are purchasing new interceptors. The air unit is getting an upgrade with our C-26 fixed wing. And I'd like to thank the United States government for giving us additional surveillance equipment. We will continue to deport and repatriate illegal immigrants as this is an integral part of border security. There is a Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Marine and Riverine branch that is currently operating and more officers being trained. The Caranage police station that's being built will become the headquarters for this Trinidad and Tobago Marine and Riverine branch. And there is going to be implemented in this fiscal a special vetted unit for multi-agency border unit. We've already begun getting the training for Air Corp and C Corp. It's ongoing, and this will be to tackle legal ports of entry because we know that the legal ports of entry are facilitating, unfortunately, illegal firearms, contraband, and narcotics. A unit that will comprise customs as part of it, vetted officers, the police service, the defense force, and intelligence services is going to be put into place to tackle this scourge at our legal ports of entry. The anti-gang fight. The anti-gang legislation has been applied and utilized. 
Unfortunately, I don't have the time to give the statistics, but I'm sure we will get there. However, I'm putting the country on notice that there's a sunset clause that expires soon, and we will be approaching the parliament to continue it because it is being used. It takes time to build the evidence. There have been a number of substantial charges of persons as gang leaders and those assisting them. It has also assisted the police service and the specialized units in being able to get warrants and also to detain persons suspected of gang activity for longer than the 72 hour period via legislation. I assure the country it is being utilized and it needs to continue. Illegal firearms. Illegal firearms are a serious problem in national security. We re-established CIRU, the Special Evidence Recovery Unit. It was as a minister in the office of the Prime Minister, along with the Prime Minister, in a meeting with the US authorities. <clears throat> we were told not too long after, 20, in the 2016 period, this unit that has received specialized training by the ATF in the United States and other law enforcement bodies in the United States was trained and under the UNC it was disbanded and the officers sent everywhere. Again, question, why would you disband a unit that must analyze ballistics and do special evidence recovery? We put it back together. We have also arranged, I also arranged training through the British High Commission on ballistics. We had for, for the first time a forensics ballistics evidence analysis training to train police officers, over 20 of them, to ease that ballistic backlog. This is what is taking place, and I tell the population through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I also remind the population that as we fight the scourge of illegal firearms, the opposition was opposed to us amending the Bail Act and the Firearm Act. And I ask this question, how could the opposition justify bail for a person held with an automatic firearm or a grenade. A neighbor next door with a small population, Barbados, passed legislation that there should be no bail for illegal firearms for 24 months. We were seeking no bail for automatic firearms for 90 days, and it was opposed by the opposition. The CCTV, the national CCTV, is being upgraded. We fought a hard fight. Again, the population needs to know that we fought a fight against corruption, I suspect, in the CCTV arena. Immediately through, finally, having a competitive tender process, reducing the bill to the taxpayers by over $300 million a year. COVID has unfortunately pushed us back in the implementation, but we're waiting for the technicians, and they are going to come in to set it up, and that will happen this fiscal or prisons. We, have up, we are in the process of upgrading the remand facilities at Golden Grove. We have upgraded and are upgrading the security systems at maximum security and Golden Grove. The CCTV, the alarm, I can't get into the details. Even the fence, it upsets me as a citizen that $80 million was spent to build a fence that surrounds nothing at the prison. And then now, in a time of little, we are trying to fix the, to, to build a similar fence around the prisons at Golden Grove. And we will get it done. We have renewed the fight against contraband being taken into the prisons. We are even using in the prisons a multi-agency assistance approach. We amended the interception of communication. Remember, you have two more minutes. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank two persons who have been doing phenomenal work in our prison system over the past decade. Debbie Jacob and Sister Kena Reinsink for working with our prisoners and giving them hope. The fire services, immigration, we have fixed, knock on wood, and I'm actually getting a lot of messages, the whole passport renewal system. People are saying that they're able to get their, their appointments to go in and to get a passport, to do the whole thing within a space of days. TT Post is now working along with us for the delivery of this system. I just want to close by saying, I didn't get to touch on it in the detail I had hoped. This cry about the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and National Security getting a reduction in the budget. We understand that we are in difficult financial times. And I give the commitment as a minister that we will work with what we get and we will stretch it and make it work. 
and to the police officers and the police service. Continue doing the great job that you're doing. Because the police service actually got almost the same amount that we got to run the whole rest of the ministry. Defense force, fire, prisons, immigration, the SSA, lifeguards, and general admin. But we will work together and we'll get it done. And it will not affect our delivery. It is going to be a difficult period. But I can stand here assured as a Minister of National Security charged with the responsibility for those services in my interaction with the men and the women in national security. I tell the population they remain committed in their fight against crime and criminality. And we will do what we need to do with the limited resources that we are thankful for as we resolve and continue to do what we can to make Trinidad and Tobago a safer and more secure Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Naparima, and I will...